find ourselves often in between places. Uh, We find ourselves on the road. We find ourselves between work and home and school. And we find ourselves a lot of times in between those places, trying to figure out how to get there and what's the meaning of it all. And we live this fast-paced life between these places, and we feel this dichotomy that we don't know how to name. In the places where we have control and education and power and influence, like home and school and work, we feel pretty comfortable. But then when we get on the road, we feel vulnerable. It's like your PhDs don't really matter when you're in Dallas-Fort Worth, stuck on the tarmac two times in a row, Patrick Mead, right? Because that's what the road does to us. It humbles us. It makes us vulnerable. Some philosophers call this the liminal space. It's the space in your life in which you realize you're always transitioning. You're always moving. You're always on to the next thing. You're always finding a new gray hair. Can I get a witness? Like, you just find yourself realizing that the one constant is that things don't stay the same. It's, it's the realization that we are liminal creatures. We, were, we are always in transition. We are always in progress. And so from Jewish scriptures to Christian scriptures to all kinds of literature around the world, the place where people change often is not the place where we have control and influence and power. It's the place and the space where we are vulnerable. This is how it works. In 2008, my wife Cara and I went to the Source Cafe in the Basoga Bible School with Sarah Barton. This was in the time of my life when I worked for Sarah Barton. That, that was serious, by the way. Uh, that was the time she used to write my sermons. So in 2008, we went to the Basoga Bible School to teach on Luke Acts. And after we had finished this great class on Luke Acts, we decided to take safari. And Sarah had warned us. Now, some people have good experiences. Some people have bad experiences. She was kind of giving us the mystic pep talk, like just be in every moment and receive it all as gift, you know, we were, so we were getting our Buddhist on, and we were trying to, like, get ready for that. And we had a great 36 hours. We saw a lot of different things, things that I didn't see growing up in East Detroit. And as we're leaving the park, this huge reserve in Kenya, and we're about to go to the airport to fly back to Michigan, our driver, Jumba, pulls over to the side of the road and he starts pointing with his lips and with his hand and he's pointing furiously and all we can see parallel to us are two really large elephants running faster than any elephant we had seen run up to that point. And so we're not really sure what to do with this. We don't really know how to make sense of this. So we're just watching, and we're in one of those vans where the roof raises about 12 inches, and you can kind of see more than you would normally be able to see in an SUV or a van. And then all of a sudden, the elephants turn, and now they are running directly towards where we are parked. And I'm thinking, Jumba, we're paying you a lot of money, man. Step on the gas. (laughs) And as they're running towards us, I felt like my heart start to rip through my chest, but Sarah and Cara are in the van, and I'm supposed to be the man with the plan, right? So I'm watching this happen, trying not to freak out, thinking any moment now, Jumba's going to put this thing in drive, and we're going to be out of here. And as we are watching these elephants approaching us, all of a sudden, about six six feet below our sight line, two lions emerge out of the brush. There was a chase happening And we thought it would be cool to be in the middle of it. (laughs) And so the first, the male lion, I can still, when I close my eyes, I can see his head so crystal clear. He is terrified. And as he's running, he doesn't realize there's a six-foot ravine between where he's running and where we're parked. And he tumbles two and a half times, and his tail, and the ba- his back end, clips the back of our van. And I screamed like a 13-year-old girl at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> I mean, Cara screamed like a girl at a... No, I, it was me. And, 
And then the female line came right behind the male line, and she was a little smarter, insert, jer- insert joke there, and she just kind of just kind of gallops over this crevice, this space, and they go behind us into this little ravine, this water area, and then for some reason, the elephants just turn back on their path. And in that moment, still thinking, Jumba, how much are we paying you, man? Like, a few minutes down the road, Jumba started to do this, like, belly laugh. And this is what I remember him saying, you Americans, you think the lion is the king of the jungle. It's not. It's the elephant. My first thought was, the lion king has been tricking us all these years, you guys. <laughs> like, they owe us a lot of money. How many, how many of you memorize those songs? The elephant's the king of the jungle? It's one thing to watch a documentary on the Discovery Channel. It's a whole different thing to be on the road, on the way, and to be totally vulnerable and exposed to how small you are in the grand scheme of things. This is one thing scripture repeats over and over and over. One of my favorite stories that Eugene Peterson tells in his book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, based on the great Hopkins poem, which is basically a retelling of our text in Luke 24 tonight, Peterson says that the road taught him a great deal. These liminal places, these transient places where your heart is open in a way that you you just don't even realize and fear and terror are also coexisting with hope and excitement. He says as a little boy growing up in Montana, he was often picked on because the little town he lived in in Montana was hostile to Christianity, especially evangelical conservative Christianity. And he said, there was one bully in the town where he grew up who on his way from home to school and school to home would call him the Jesus sissy. There goes Gene Peterson, the Jesus sissy. There he goes. And it was, it was like this, this major issue in Peterson's life. And he, so he goes to his mother after a couple of weeks and he says, look, Garrison Johns will not stop picking on me. What am I supposed to do? Peterson's mom, a devout student of the Sermon on the Mount, quotes Jesus' words about how we treat our enemies, which doesn't work well for an 11-year-old boy very long. So finally, after a few more days of this, Peterson writes this in, in, in incredible detail. He says, something inside me totally snapped. And he said, I took Garrison Johns by the collar And I threw him on the ground and I started punching him so hard that blood flowed out of his nose like a crimson river. It formed a crimson stain. And as I'm punching him and beating him like the crowd turned on John's and now they're cheering for me. Get him. Get him. And he said, the only thing I could think in that moment is my mother is going to kill me. And so he's doing this and it's moving fast in his head and he thinks, how can I get out of this situation? So he said, I did what most boys did my age. He said, I told him to say uncle. I grew up saying, say mercy. But he said, say uncle, say uncle. And Garrison Johns refused. And Peterson said, I relied on my biblical Christian training in a moment of weakness. I said the only thing I could think of in that moment. Then I said, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And Garrison John says, I give, I confess, I confess. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And Peterson writes in Christ plays in 10,000 places, and I quote, Garrison Johns was my first convert to the Christian faith. <laughs> and then Peterson goes on to describe how the road opens you up. You learn something about yourself, oftentimes things you don't want to know about yourself. When you're not at work, you're not at home, you're not at school, but you're in those liminal, open spaces. Our whole country was founded on the anxiousness of settlers and explorers who wanted to see what was on the other side of the water, right? American culture changes the beginning of the 20th century when Henry Ford's Model T becomes replicable and very affordable. 
Like you could go from the Midwest to LA in two days and now with air technology, you can be in New York and LA and not miss sunrise or sunset. And so this is part of the American story, being on the road. But it's ancient. It's as old as the Iliad and the Odyssey, or for you low culture, low culture people, oh brother, where art thou? <laughs> it's as old as Abraham and Sarah. It's as old as Joseph and Jacob. It's as recent as the March on Washington during the Civil Rights Movement. It's as recent as the Malcolm X film depicted the Hajj pilgrimage for all Muslims who are trying to show their devout faith. So not only America, but Christianity doesn't even have a corner on the idea that God works in humans' lives in those liminal, open spaces where your heart is raw and vulnerable to God. Consider Christianity. Jesus goes on a three-year road tour that makes the Rolling Stones look like the Beach Boys. For three years, he's on the road, and he's going from place to place and town to town and city to city and province to province. His final few days is called the path, the Via Dolorosa. The Apostle Paul has his life changed on the Damascus road, and then he spends the rest of his life in what we call the three missionary journeys of Paul. You may find it interesting that many philosophers today argue that the shift from the modern world to the postmodern world is embodied in a novel that some of you have read called On the Road, Kirok's book, which described kind of the movement from certainty and values to everything's open, everything's possible. In fact, those of you who love literature, you know that Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road, is actually in answer to that book, On the Road, where you go this dark, desolate, apocalyptic, just horrible experience, and then at the very end of that book, spoiler alert, hope emerges. And it's like McCarthy's way to say, Kirat got it wrong. There is always hope at the end of the road. And so in Luke 24, I'd like to retell this story. If you have your New Testaments, I've been known to lie about stories, so go ahead and open Luke 24. Maybe exaggerate is the better word. We call it preaching. <laughs> uh, in Luke 24, Luke tells a story that is connecting to the ancient narratives that these Jewish Christians would have known like you and I know the basic tenets of the New Testament. So here's how the story goes in the middle of Luke 24. There are two people traveling back from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's a seven-mile trek. Uh, there's a really compelling argument that this is a married couple. And no, not because they're arguing. That's not the compelling reason. But there is a compelling argument that this is a married couple. And they left Emmaus to Jerusalem because they believed that there was something unique about Jesus. Jesus wasn't the first person to attempt to be the Messiah, and he certainly wasn't the last, but for these two, there was something about his teachings, something about his life, something about the energy that he produced in that part of the world, which they said, we're going to make that trek because there's something happening we don't want to miss. And so they start with great hope. And then their hopes are dashed when Jesus dies. The death of Jesus marked the messianic hopes that so many had. Israel had placed all of their expectations on his shoulders. His body wasn't the only thing that died on Golgotha. All right, and so they're making this pilgrimage back home. They've, they're tired. They've been on this three-day journey, and they're confused. And this is what Luke says. Luke says they argue about the meaning of the scriptures. And what they're arguing about is not whether Jesus was a failure or not. They both agree that he's a failure because he's dead. What they disagree on is which scripture do they understand how big of a failure Jesus was. And that's the conversation that's taking place when Jesus, who loves to mess with people, I mean, he's a pro, he's just a jester in these contexts. He sneaks up on the road 
And he asks them, without them knowing who he is, in his resurrected body, hey, what are you guys arguing about? And one responds, what, have you been under a rock? Bad question. Um, (laughs) That was cheap. That was cheap. (laughs) That was cheap. What do you mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, great in word and deed. And we had high hopes. Not, not just us, like our, all of our people had high hopes that he would be the one. And then we realized that we had hedged our bets on the wrong person. We backed the wrong horse. Have you ever rooted for a team or a person, and then when it came to that crucial moment or that crucial game, they got blown out? Clippers fans are like, nope, I don't know what that's like. (laughs) But that's essentially what they're describing to Jesus. We had placed all of our hopes, all of our passion, all of our interpretation of what it means to be a Jew on this one, and his own people turned him over and he was executed. But some say that he's still around, that he's still kind of lingering hanging out. This is what's so important about this story. The Bible wasn't enough. In fact, this may be uncomfortable for you, but one of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible says the Bible's not enough. Because they had the Bible. And yet, the Bible that they were reading and the way that they were reading, because they're like you and me, they're fallible, socially located people, took them to a dead end. And once they came to a dead end, the only way that they could carve a new road or a new path was to have a mystical, real, visionary encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Who basically says, the Bible's telling you that the Bible's not enough. Because if you have the Bible without Jesus, you just have another book. For those of you who love theology, this is Karl Barth in 60 seconds. And so they have this conversation and he opens up their minds and he takes these Isaiah texts, we think, Luke doesn't tell us, would be nice to know, and he takes these other texts, maybe Daniel 6, and then he puts them together in a way like a telescope. Then they can see differently, but they don't quite get it. And so as they're close to Emmaus, this long walk back, Jesus is still playful. He pretends like he's going to keep going, and they insist it's been a long day. Come in and eat with us. And that's where verse 30 picks up in Luke 24. And when they were at table, Luke 24 says, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks. He distributed it. And then Luke says this incredible phrase. He said, it literally reads in the Greek, and the eyes of them were opened. And then they went back. It goes on to say in this section. And then they go back and they tell the disciples, remember how you guys had heard these like strange things that we weren't sure exactly what was going on? We, our hearts were burning on the road and we didn't know why until our eyes were opened and then just like he did the last time we nailed him down, he got away again, you guys. And you get this sense that there's this equal distribution of excitement and absolute terror. Because they thought they'd gone to Jerusalem for a touchdown celebration. They left in great despair and cynicism only to return back to hope that exceeded the hope that they had three days prior. Now, this story becomes the story for Catholics and Protestants around the world. It's the way that we understand the communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. It provides the pattern, not just for the bread and the juice or the wine, and if we argue about if it's like the body of Christ or if it is the body of Christ or how is it the body of Christ, and all those debates we've had between Protestants and Catholics, it provides the formula for how God takes the church, breaks the church, distributes the church after giving thanks for the church, and then the eyes of the world are open. That's what Tyson was talking about. We become the communion, the bread, 
and the wine, the bread, and the cup. Uh, My Jewish friends have pointed out rather insistently that you cannot read Luke 24 if you haven't read the Torah. Now, I know some of us think, no, you don't need the Torah. But my Jewish friends have pointed out that any Jew who would have read Luke 24 would have automatically thought of one text and one text alone, the first seven verses of Genesis 3. Because two times in Genesis 3, the phrase is exactly in Greek, the phrase that appears in Luke 24. The phrase is this, and the eyes of them were open. The serpent appears to the woman and says a lie right off the beginning. Is it true that God said that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And to the woman's credit, she clarifies, no, 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 no. He just said we can't eat from that one. And the serpent says, well, (laughs) you know he's holding out on you, right? He just doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to have your eyes opened. And when he says that, when the serpent says that, something is triggered in the woman, and she thinks, God's holding out on me. Right? There's this whole garden with everything she could ever need and every, everything she could ever possibly want except for that one thing. And then she becomes fixated on that one thing, particularly wisdom, Genesis 3 says. And so she takes, she reaches, and she convinces Adam to do the same. And it says again for the second time, and the eyes of them were open. My Jewish friends would say any Jew who is receiving the story of the Emmaus Road would see that the Emmaus Road story is the reversal of Genesis 3. 200 years before Jesus was born, approximately, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into the Greek language. It's called the Septuagint. You'll see it marked LXX. All that means is you can actually read the Greek, the Greek interpretations, translations of Torah. And when you take Genesis 3 and you take Luke 24 and you put them together in Greek, they are almost exactly word for word the same. See, the church didn't think necessarily that Jesus was doing a new thing. The church believed that what Jesus was doing was so radical meaning so back to the root, that it looked to be a new thing. It looked to be something they couldn't comprehend. This is why, if you're keeping score, when Luke gives you meal stories in his gospel, he places them very strategically. There are eight meal stories in the gospel of Luke. The seventh one, the completion of Jesus' life on earth, is Luke 22. It's the new exodus. It's the fact that God is going to do through Jesus for Israel what Israel could not do for Israel's self. This is completion. It's wholeness. You know that. That's what the number seven means. And then the Emmaus Road story is number eight. It's the next new thing that God is doing in the world. God has inaugurated. He has launched this new project. And it isn't so much about the past now. It's about leaning in to the future through the past. Several months ago, uh, those of us who were going to keynote gathered in great Christian suffering on the beaches of Malibu with Mike at the Brock House. Um, We preachers have it better than we let on. I probably shouldn't tell that secret. Okay. And I'll never forget, we were working through these texts, and we were talking about the table, and John Mark Hicks, one of our best scholars in Churches of Christ, he got very personal He lost a son. And he said, in my words, he said, when I want to grieve the past, I go to the cemetery to be with my son. He said, but when I want to remember the future that's on its way, the resurrection of the body, the great eschatological meal, the banquet, the party, the dance with Jesus. I don't just go to the cemetery to grieve. I go to be with the saints to remember that Jesus is no longer on the cross. That's what communion's about. That's why it's the eighth meal. God has started a new thing. It's like a brand new era, a new kingdom project. Uh, There's a picture that will look very ordinary to you, but this is a picture from Ur. It's called a ziggurat. And it's basically a hill, if you could bring that picture up. 
And this is from Ur, which is one of the most, uh, the oldest ancient cities. Now, Ur is known now because God called a particular couple, Abraham and Sarai, out of Ur. What's significant to know is that Abraham was not a Jew. We know that, right? It's Bible 101. Jesus wasn't a Christian, right? He didn't have a WWID bracelet (laughs) or sing happy birthday to me on Christmas, right? So Abraham's not a Jew. Jesus isn't a Christian. That will mess with your theology. God takes Abraham out of the New York City of his day from Ur, which some archaeologists believe practiced child sacrifice, just like in some of the dark moments of Israel's story. And God does a new thing in an old age. You know, Jews call the sacrifice of Isaac the Akeda. It's one of the most mysterious, troubling texts in any synagogue community. But what some rabbis have taught is yes, there are questions with genocide, and yes, there are some really difficult texts in the Old Testament, but one of the things that God is doing with Abraham is he is showing Abraham that he doesn't work like the gods Abraham grew up sacrificing and being around living in that culture. And so when he calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, as painful as it is, Abraham knows that story. He grew up in it. It was all around him. But then when God rescues Isaac, when he rescues Abraham's heart, it's like God is slowly introducing in time and history. It's not that you feed me. It's not that you appease me. It's not that I'm angry. It's that I provide every good thing. See, this is what went wrong in the garden This is what went wrong in the first century, and it's what goes wrong in the 21st century. Instead of having hands open and realizing that all of life is a gift, we see the one thing we don't have. And instead of being content with all that we have, we become fixated on all that we think we need. And so we reach and we grab, and that's why we need to change our language, church, we don't take the Lord's Supper. That's consumer language. This isn't McDonald's. We receive the Lord's Supper because it's all gift. And the most dangerous prayer you can ever pray, regardless of where you are, if you're agnostic or Jew or atheist or Christian, the most dangerous prayer you can ever pray is, God, all of this that I have, and name it, Blue Bell ice cream. Can I get a witness? Those rolls that they give you at Texas Roadhouse where you watch the butter melt on top. Dr. Pepper. I just realized I'm almost Texan by that confession. Like, you know, preachers like Tyson Moore who said, the reason Paul was mad is not because they were drunk, it's because they were drinking alone. Like, you know, if if you can say, God, I'm thankful for so, (laughs) so much good. And even those of you who have had a really difficult life, I always come to this moment in counseling with people through the horrors of life when you still get to the point where you can say, it's still better to have been alive through all of this than to never have been alive at all. And when you can get to that point and you say, God, I receive it all as gift, all of its gift, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, the highs, the lows, it's all gift. You are participating In Luke 24, where we open our hands and we realize that Jesus has been amongst us the entire time. Some of you may have seen this op-ed piece that Michael Gerson wrote for the Washington Post, but it it slayed Americans. It slayed the hearts of Americans when he described what it was like to drop off his son at college his freshman year. And Gerson essentially takes this position that he realizes he has to receive every moment that he had with his son as pure gift. And even though he's not ready to drop his 18-year-old son off at a college, he recognizes the sanctity of that moment. And so he writes this. It was one of the most read op-ed pieces of all of 2013. The cosmologists, even with all their depressing talk about the eventual heat death of the cosmos, offer some comfort. They point out that we live in the briefest window, a fraction of a fraction of the unimaginable vastness of deep time in which it is physically possible for life to exist. So we inhabit, or are chosen to inhabit, an astounding 
privilege instant in the lifespan of the universe. I'm not just saying it's good to be Church of Christ. I'm saying it's good to be human. In 1966, Time Magazine did something that Time Magazine had never done up to that point. They put a text block on the cover of their magazine with this question, is God dead? And they were participating in a conversation that had been happening in philosophy for several years based on an essay that Nietzsche wrote in 1862. Now some people misread Nietzsche. He wasn't even so much making a commentary on whether God was dead or alive, though he probably believed God was dead. He was pointing out that if you walk the streets of Europe and even the United States, based on the way that people lived, God was dead with technology and warfare and transportation and medicine and hospitals. Sometimes the very things that we think will save us, Nietzsche pointed out, are the very things that are actually killing God. So Time Magazine, several years, tried to take this mainstream and ask, is God dead? And you know in the 1960s, everything that was happening, the tectonic plates of our culture was shifting. So that question was being asked on college campuses all around the world and in the United States, is God dead? That same year in 1966, the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl. Ronald Reagan became governor of California for the first time. Bill Russell became the first black coach in the history of the NBA. The Beatles produced the uh, great rock album, Rubber Soul. Sounds of Silence was the number one song played in 1966. And a scientist from small town Missouri, sorry Mike, Missouri, <laughs> in 1966 named A.W. Dykus retired was married for the second time, and like some of you, he annoyed his wife to no end. And so she said, look, in your retirement, you need to do something. Now, this was the guy who invented the turn signal. Okay, some of you don't know what that is. It's that little thing, <laughs> um, elders of the church, it's that little thing. But he was a devout Christian, and his wife encouraged him, why don't you write? You're, such a, you're so gifted with words. And this whole thing was swirling in the United States. Is God dead? And most of what he wrote, no one knows, except one poem that became a song. It is the anthem of Churches of Christ, 728B. Anyone familiar with that song? <laughs> so Dykus pins that song out of the cultural milieu of what's going on. And then this song, not just in Churches of Christ, but it becomes a moment of confession. Not a touchdown dance, but to say, no, we believe that God is not done yet. So this is my question as we sing this song. Would you stand with me? You came here for something. And you don't even know what that is often. But you came for a reason. You thought it was for one thing, but maybe it's another thing. Maybe you came to network or connect or to feel hope or something, but then it became something else. And my question for you is not even for two or 3,000 people, whoever, however many are here. My question is, just like Jesus on the road, are there just two people here tonight that need to know that death is not the last word? Are there two people here tonight that need to know that death is a comma, not a period? Are there two people here tonight that need to know that disease and deception and destruction and war and military strategy and political games and the tax bill that you just had to write. Can I get an amen? Do you need to know that those do not get the last word? That the life of faith is not a dead end, but the resurrection of Jesus is a cul-de-sac that takes us to a whole new road that no one could have ever possibly imagined. Is there anyone here tonight that needs to know that your worst moment is not your final moment, that the worst thing that's ever happened to you is not the last thing. That's what Emmaus Road is about. And as we sing this song together, some of you can sing it from your head to your toes, and some of you can barely sing, but sing with everything you have if this is your song. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tipped his skies with heavenly hue. 